Brethren, very glad to be here, and uh, we do want to have a little break since we can't have singing, but uh, I don't want it to be a ten-minute break. It might get us all, it it seems to break the theme of the service, so maybe just a three-minute break or something like that will be good normally. Uh, I appreciate Mr. Joseph's uh, fine sermonette, and we will be trying to have sermonettes by two or three of our leading men as we come along, and uh, that can be very helpful, and later, of course, as soon as we can, we'll have singing. Uh, Mr. Uh, Davis mentioned uh, Mr. Meredith, and I think I mentioned to a number of you that I think I'm going to start going more by Mr. Meredith than Dr. Meredith, but if older brethren or students, former students, call me Dr. Meredith, that's fine. Uh, You can call me Mr., call me Doctor, just call me when it's time to eat. That's the main thing, and uh, very important. I can't eat too much today. I have a cold, by the way, and some of you can probably hear it in my nose. I've been battling a cold for two days. I'm not coughing or snorting to give you anything. It's about gone. But I, I want you to know that if I sort of snort or something is wrong or sound more nasal, well, that's the reason. It's because of this weather. I got out in the rain a couple of days ago and got it. Then I got a little better. And then yesterday afternoon, we had some advertising agents over, and I went off to, out to see them off. And uh, then I had to take a cloth across, the uh, anointed cloth across. I missed the mo- postman because of a long-distance call. They just kept going on and on and on from Australia, by the way. I was encouraged by that, but this guy sure spent his money. He kept on the line. So anyway, I wanted to take the anointed cloth across the street to the postman. I missed his first swing, but I ran across and got wet again. Anyway, that's how a cold does when you, when you have one like that. And uh, Mr. Davis mentioned, or I guess he was starting to mention this too, but I want to tell you all this as well. You'll notice on the new uh, letterhead on our letters that it's just Roderick Meredith Evangelist. And I really feel that's better. I got a suggestion from one of my friends in the field, uh, who is still with the Worldwide, but very much with us in spirit and will be with us later, about that. And I just thought, well, that's the normal title that Mr. Dukach had and others had and so on. But, uh, you know, that has kind of a uh, military connotation and so on, pastor general and so on. I'm not condemning it, but I just thought we're so small and maybe it looked funny, so we're just changing it to evangelist. This friend said, well, that's what you were ordained at, and that's right, Christ ordained me as an evangelist, so that's just what I'll be, and uh, so on. So you'll all notice that little difference there. I'm not pastor general anymore. I didn't demoted myself, and uh, that's better than someone else demoting you, I guess. Well, it's good to see so many of you here in spite of the rain. Our ladies from Palmdale who come down with several children are not here, so that cost us six or eight people right there. And uh, some others uh, have have a sickness, I know. I I won't mention their names. I don't want to get anyone in trouble, but a couple, three others would be here except they are sick and have been anointed. And as I said, I was a little bit sick myself because of the rain. But it is good that so many of you are here. And uh, we are grateful for the brethren all over the country who are beginning to attend these little home uh, churches. We can call them churches. Some of them are just six or eight people. Uh, Some of them are unofficial, like this one up north is just unofficial. We didn't know he was going to have one. But I guess we can start calling him one if he has a regular group there. We did start our first regular home church last Sabbath in Abilene, Texas. I told you I would announce it. And it, it just we were expecting just seven or eight people. Honestly, that's what he thought. It turned out two extra ladies came at the last minute, so they had ten. Now today, right now today, we have just started or are finishing our service in Little Rock, Arkansas. And we should have somewhere around 30 to 45 people there. I don't know the number. We'll hear later. But they may have about as many as we do today for the very first service in Little Rock, Arkansas. So we're very grateful for that. Next week will be another small home church of probably 8 to 12 people. And then the following week after that, another big church, perhaps our biggest church ever to begin. So we'll uh, keep the time and place a great mystery uh, from uh, all the enemies and so on. But that will be coming along. And we do have a number of other churches lined up that will be starting over the next few months. So we are grateful. We did see the advertising men uh, just yesterday about getting on radio. I don't want to announce the exact city or time until we actually have the station approve it. This is an offer, and we better wait till they sign the contract. You know, that would be embarrassing. But we have accepted two different uh, uh, programs on one station, one at night and then one the next afternoon, and we hope uh, to get on soon. We'll tell you about it later, uh, back in the Midwest and then another one further east, and then we're still working on one for here. So you can pray about it that we can get on a decent station, not a big station. They're terribly expensive at first, but a station we would reach all of you and many of your friends here in Southern California. So we'll appreciate your prayers for that. 
This is a special day. I think all of us know that. Perhaps some of you have forgotten. This is the seventh anniversary of the death of Herbert W. Armstrong, who founded this work, the work of God, that in fact we are now carrying on. And I think that uh, certainly others feel they are, and that's up to each one how he does and all that. I'm not trying to judge that, but we are certainly carrying on that work ourselves and intend to in the right way as God gives us his guidance and his spirit and his power. Mr. Armstrong died seven years ago today. As most of you know, I was a very close, closely associated with Mr. Armstrong, and I guess of those still living, uh, I'm one of the three or four that are the closest living on earth today who spent literally thousands of hours with Mr. Armstrong. I've been in his home dozens of times, had him in my home, and spent you know hundreds of times with him eating in restaurants and in meetings and staying in the same hotel room or suite, traveling with him on the same ship or plane or train and all this type of thing, and did get to know him like a second father very, very well. I had the opportunity to be there as a sad opportunity at the death of my beloved friend, Richard David Armstrong, his older son, and uh, I was right there uh, when Mr. Armstrong actually heard that Dick had been hit. And I saw Mr. Armstrong's reaction when uh, this man called from up north crying about it from the, from the hospital where himself was injured. And I was sitting directly opposite Mr. Armstrong in his little office up in the penthouse over the library building. Some of you have seen that little office, and you may remember. I don't know if anyone here has seen that. But anyway, it was a very small office, and as he said, he used a woman's dressing table as his desk at first. And he was sitting facing me and talking to this man on the phone and made arrangements at that point for me to be in charge of the work in Pasadena because Ted was back in uh, uh, Springfield in a campaign and said, you run things here, I'm going to have Norman Smith drive me up there, and so on. And so I was there as that happened and saw how he handled that terrible trauma. I'll come to that later. I was there uh, with him when he heard about Dick's death, and uh, then I was there with him in the mortuary when we saw Dick's dead body uh, right on the slab, which is very sad to think about, but we were there, and I talked him into, which I think he says in his autobiography, I don't remember, but I talked him into praying for Dick. I did. I was very young, in the truth, very zealous, and I was very sincere, and asked him to pray, or suggested, and so he did, I think out of concern for me, as he said later, but that God would raise Dick from the dead. And during the funeral service, I was looking up and thinking, well, maybe God will look at the clouds up at Mountain View Cemetery. I can remember that to this day. As a young minister, just 28 years old, knew in the truth, hoping God would raise Dick from the dead. I was there, uh, of course, uh, in the work and with him and talking. I think the day his mother died and he asked me to perform the funeral of his own mother, Eva Armstrong, Mrs. Armstrong Sr., who died, of course, at age 95 and a half after a wonderful long life. I was in the room when Mrs. Armstrong died, Loma Armstrong, uh, his wife. He had several of us there. We'd been praying for her, and we were actually right there when she died and got to see his reaction to that, which was a fine reaction, by the way. There's some that have tried to imply otherwise, but he did not have some bad reaction at all. He'd been crying. He'd been praying, very concerned, and when it finally hit him, he just slumped, and he didn't immediately rush to her because he had been with her before, loving her, patting her hand, comforting her, tell her he loved her. And when she finally was dead, I think he decided not to do it at that. People react differently to different circumstances. But at any rate, I was there at that time and saw how he made decisions about her situation. Mr. Armstrong was not perfect. I do not worship Mr. Armstrong, and I do, want, do not want anyone worshiping me. I think that's a lot less likely than anyone would worship me because I have the thin face and the thick glasses and Missouri twang and whatever else is wrong, and a lot of you know that. So I hope you all understand that. But I to totally subscribe to Mr. Joseph's uh, uh, sermonette, we must not worship men, we'd better worship God, honor them, and let's try to lay down our lives for our brethren and serve one another. But Mr. Armstrong was a man of great faith and great courage, and he certainly had those. And if you read his autobiography, you'll see a faith and a courage just ringing through that over and over and over again, because he tried with all of his heart to do what God said, and not just what Mr. Armstrong wanted to do. But he also, my brethren, had balance. He did not go to one extreme or the other and get all nutty about things, and he had big-mindedness. He saw the big picture and didn't get all down on some little things. Sometimes some of us get very interested in health, and we should get interested in health and eat better and do better. One of the reasons I have this cold is because I've broken two of the laws of health. 
and it's not altogether my fault. You say, oh, there you are, you're guilty. Well, yes, I am guilty, but of course, uh, for the last five or six weeks, I've been losing sleep most nights, not every night, because of calls day and night and in the morning, and your mind wakes up, everything is different, and this new work is going, and what's going on, and it's been one of the biggest traumas of my life. Of course, after 43 years in the work of God, you know, 43 and a half years almost, and uh, this all happened. So, of course, I have lost sleep for five or six weeks, and now we've been having rain for, what is it, a week or ten days almost straight, and my wife and I normally take a walk in the morning, and then we take another walk in the evening, and after the evening walk, I used to come in and do a bunch of push-ups and run, do this and that and so on, and get sweaty after the big walk in the evening. Well, now it's been raining and raining and cooped up, and I can't. But let's say we should obey God's laws of health. Sometimes we can't do it to the same degree we would like. But you need not need to get picky about every little thing. You shouldn't eat a whole bunch of white sugar. But as Mr. Armstrong explained, he did have white sugar in his home. He did put put, put white sugar sometimes on his cereal or in his coffee. And yet he didn't have it all around and eat candy bars and all that kind of thing. He didn't make a big deal about little things. It's all right to eat, all right to eat uh, you know, sunflower seeds and... Uh, alfalfa and whatever, but you don't want to make a religion out of that either. You want to see the big picture as best you can in all these things. He tried not to be a pinhead on little matters. On this special day, I want to speak on faith and on healing. And I think that's a tremendously important topic. And it's some one of the topics that's going to differentiate us as the Church of God here. And I think you know the problem I'm talking about. Uh, where many of our brethren have been kind of subtly taken away from that right faith. So once again, let's see what the Bible says on this particular topic at this time. Let's turn first of all, brethren, back to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. And we're talking here about the life of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and what He did. Then, verse 18, chapter 18 of Luke, I mean, in verse 1, Then He spoke a parable to them, that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. In other words, you're to pray and keep on praying and keep on praying and not give up too easily. And he said there was a certain city, in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard men. This judge wasn't easily moved one way or the other. Now, there was a widow in that city, and she came to him saying, Avenge me on my adversary. And afterward he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Do I do not regard God? nor men, he said, Yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest her, by her continual coming she weary me. You know, he didn't want to put this widow in jail, I guess. <laughs> that would look funny. She just kept coming. She said, Judge, please help me. Judge, please help me. So he finally said, I better get her off my back. You know, I better give her some, some relief here. Then the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said. In other words, if this unjust judge, this carnal guy, will do this, how much more will God take care of us? And shall not God avenge His own elect who cry out day and night? Now, let's remember that one thing that He also said here, my brethren. He didn't say those who come to Him for about three minutes and say, God, uh, please heal me. Uh, God, please bless me. And then they let six months go by and they say, Oh, yeah, I, I, I asked God six months ago to heal me and I forgot to pray about it or even think about it for six months. Kind of like your little boy coming and saying, Well, Daddy, I'd like a bicycle. And he mentions it one time just as you're on the way to work and then he never mentions it again. Well, you forgot it when you got home from work. If he really wanted that bicycle, you know what a little boy will do, don't you? He'll camp on your doorstep. He'll be there all the time. Daddy, want a bicycle. Daddy, want a bicycle. Until he tries to wear you down. And, of course, we shouldn't try to wear God down. That's not the idea. But God, God does want us to keep coming. He wants us to be drawn closer to Him by having to come back to Him, you see, on our knees, again and again and again. And that's good for us. And so we come to Him night and day if we're faithful. I tell you that He will avenge them speedily. That is, those who keep coming over a period of time and don't give up. Nevertheless... Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes, will He really find faith on the earth? Will Christ really find faith on this earth, brethren? The implication is, and certainly many other scriptures indicate, He won't find very much. There's not going to be very much faith on the earth when Jesus Christ comes back, even among God's people. And I think we can see that in the friends that we have in the various groups of God's churches. They, they seem to lack faith. Why? Why this great lack of faith? Well, many reasons. 
among them are science. It's one of the great reasons. Science is fine if it's used the right way and with the right understanding. But science has come up with all these pills, as we know. And if you watch television, well, then you have a pill for a cold, and you have a pill to go to sleep, and a pill to kill, uh, kill a headache, and a pill to do this, and a pill to do that. You know, it just goes on and on. There's no end. A pill for everything. And back even in my day, when I grew up, we didn't have any television. And these ads weren't just constantly bombarding our mind. And certainly before my time and my father and great-grandfather's time, when men were out plowing the furrow, you know, and looking up at the sky, and they knew that the weather depended upon God. Many of them believed that deeply. Most of them did in those days. All around them was the creation of God. And they thought about God and what God can do. God controls the weather. God controls my life. God is in charge. Yes, God controls my wife, too. <laughs> God is in charge. So that's what men used to think a lot more than they do today. Today we have the psychology, too, of course, of trying to think our way around things and, well, not get too excited about God and we can't trust these ideas and the ministers are old phobies. And then most of the ministers today don't want to be old phobies and teach what the Bible says. So they have departed from the truth further and further. And, of course, today most of the ministers and most professing Christian churches don't talk anything about healing whatsoever. You know that. And the Methodists and the Baptists and Presbyterians and Episcopalians and on and on it goes. Healing is not very much a part of their ministry. In most cases, no part whatsoever. And healing and the gospel have been totally dissociated in their minds. And yet that is not true. So we need to understand this whole concept of faith and healing. Let's go back to Matthew now. Let's turn, brethren, at this point to Matthew and begin in chapter 7. This is the famous Sermon on the Mount, part of it here. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 7. Matthew 7 and verse 7. Jesus said, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock. He said, knock. It's like you keep knocking and pounding on a door. You remember? He just got through saying there in Luke that you'd got to keep coming. Like the widow did. And come day and night. And don't give up. And so you ask, and then you seek, and then you knock. And say, God, I need help. I want help. I've got to have help. And ask for it and cry out for it. And he says, do these things and it will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks it will be opened. But you've got to ask and seek and knock. Or what man is there among you who if his son asks for bread will give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, would you give him a snake? If you then being evil, he told his disciples, and they were just normal carnal men, not unusually evil of course. But if you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask Him? God wants us to have good things. God wants us to have blessings. God wants us to have healings. But He tells us we've got to build faith and we've got to keep coming back to God and we've got to focus on God and we cannot give up and quit too soon. And so these are very important concepts. Back in Mark now, let's turn to the Gospel of Mark, the 11th chapter, and verse 22. This is one of my favorite scriptures, I think, on faith. It's Mark 11, and then you double 11. Two times 11 is 22. Mark 11, verse 22. And in the previous verses, it had just been describing how Jesus had cursed this fig tree. And they were amazed that the fig tree had withered right up. So Mark 11, verse 22, Jesus answered and said, Have faith in God. In other words, he said, yes, believe God, and these things will occur. For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will come to pass, he will have whatever he says. You've got to believe, though. You've got to sense that this is what God wants. If you ask according to His will, as the Scriptures tell us, and then believe and know that God is there and God will back it up. He will have whatever He says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Whatever things you ask. Brethren, that can be healing uh, any kind of disease, cancer, leukemia, it doesn't make any difference. Literally moving a mountain, if you had good reason, had faith that it was absolutely necessary, you could ask that. If you were thrown out of a ship in the midst of the sea and had to have help from God to walk on the water or to have something like that happen, you could ask for that. And if you had real faith, God would do that. 
Jesus said that. And if you read these things over and over, when he quieted the storm and the disciples were amazed, he said, what's wrong? Have you no faith? It was, oh, what's wrong, you guys? Can't you have faith like this too? Remember that? Over and over, Jesus gave those kind of expressions. What's wrong with you? Why can't you really trust God? Jesus tells us in his word over and over. I'll have a whole sermon someday on faith with those examples amplified even more. We don't have time today to cover everything in one sermon. And my thrust today is going to be more on healing, but healing regarding faith and faith regarding healing here. And I want to get to some just general scriptures on faith at the beginning to kind of lay a foundation. This is a powerful scripture on faith. You know, if you believe that Jesus Christ meant what he said. Whatever you ask, you see, you're going to get the answer if you believe. And if you trust in God to, to back it up. In John 15, another favorite scripture of mine on faith. John chapter 15 and beginning in verse 7. John chapter 15 and verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you. In other words, you've been studying, you've been meditating on God's word. And in that sense, as it says in 1 John 5, 14, you know, you're asking according to his will. Because you've been reading this Bible. And God's will is in this Bible. And so you know that you're asking according to God's will because God says this type of thing will come in the Bible. And you're asking that way. So he says, if you abide in me, you're walking with Christ, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. He didn't make any difference. He didn't put any limitations on it, did he? Whatever it is, it shall be done for you. As long as you can see and sense that's the kind of thing God would want to do. And he gives you examples like that, teachings like that in his word, the Bible. So we want to understand that. So we need to build faith, brethren. We need to build faith. And get this phrase, please, in your notes and in your hearts. We need to build an atmosphere of faith. And I hope in this little church that we're beginning now, the global church of God which will not remain little, although we're never going to be the size of the Roman Catholic Church, obviously, until after Christ returns. <laughs> then we'll fill the whole earth, along with all of other God's people. But at any rate, we need to build an atmosphere of faith. And that atmosphere has been missing. It really has. An atmosphere of faith for answered prayers and for healings. We're not going to have the answered prayers that we would like to have in this church or any other church unless we build an atmosphere of faith. So let's understand that. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 8 now, going back right after the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 8 carries on from that point. And I want to turn back there. Matthew chapter 8 and verse 1. Matthew chapter 8 and verse 1. When he had come down from the mountain, where he would given the Sermon on the Mount, great multitudes followed him. So here were great multitudes following Jesus Christ now after he'd given this magnificent teaching on the mount. And behold, a leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Now, Jesus Christ, as we know, brethren, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. Is it his will to heal? He said, if you are willing. And so Jesus said, he put out his hand and touched him and said, I am willing. Be clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. That is the will of Christ. And Jesus said, See that you tell no one, but go show your, go your way. Show yourself to the priest. Offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony to them. And when Jesus had entered Capernaum, this little town right on the Sea of Galilee, my wife and I had the privilege of spending several days off and on in Capernaum, uh, uh, well, back in the summer of 1988. A centurion came to him, pleading with him. A Roman captain, not a Jew, an outsider, but one that had been among the Jews and apparently honored the God of Israel. He said, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said, I will come and heal him. So Jesus honored this man because it was frankly harder for a Roman captain to just humble himself before the Jew because the Jews were supposed to be the captive people, you know, but the Roman captain honored the God of Israel. And so the centurion answered, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. I 
have enjoyed the Italian language such a little bit as I've been familiar with. I studied some singing years ago. I shouldn't have because I don't have a singing voice. But uh, Mr. Ettinger had all of us take singing in the early years of the college. Everyone who could make a sound almost, he got more money, I think, per per pupil, if if you know what I mean. So anyway, we learned how to sing, and I learned some Italian songs. My wife and my children have endured me warming up my voice with one of them once in a while that I still remember some of the words with. And if I forget some of the words, you just put in a vowel and it still sounds the same. But being in uh, Rome, Italy, about three times, I enjoy the, the. It is a wonderful singing language, and I could. Whenever I come to this, it sort of reminds me. So you won't mind the digression, I guess. But the the uh, this uh, woman, American uh, from the south of the Midwest, was saying we were in the St. Mary Majors, this great big cathedral, just as tourists, but they have magnificent buildings there. And she said, "Oh, Gertrude, this is St. Mary Majors," and they were kind of talking like that. And then this Italian guide was standing next door with the other people, and he told them, La Cattedrale di Santa Maria Maggiore. And, uh, you know, it sounds much better that way, you know. And I can picture this, uh, I can picture this centurion. He says, You just speak the word and it shall be done, you know. And uh, just write out authority there. He knew what it was. He said, For I'm a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to this one, Go. And he goes, and to another, Come, and he comes, and to my servant, Do this, and he does it. About face. And the guy just about faces right there. See, this guy understood authority. And he knew that Jesus had authority over sickness and disease. And Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we want to remember that as we pray to our Father in heaven through Jesus Christ. And so when Jesus heard it, he marveled. Here was this centurion humbling himself. He could have said, take this man out and kill him. He was the boss. But he humbled himself before Jesus because he knew Jesus was a man of a God and a great servant of the living God. And he marveled and said to those who followed, Assuredly I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. Even the Jews had watered down the concept of God so much during that particular time. No one else Jesus had encountered had the faith of this Roman centurion. And I say to you that many will come from the east and west, you see, Gentiles from outside Israel and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, and so on. And so he told the centurion then, verse 13, Go your way, and as you have believed, so let it be done to you. And the servant was healed that same hour. So it was Jesus' will to heal, and of course he marveled at the faith of this centurion. He says, I know it will be done. Now that's the kind of faith we've got to develop And brethren, I want to say this to you in all love and to you scattered brethren that are listening in on the tape out there in tape land. (laughs) Uh, We cannot suddenly have that kind of faith. The nation of America and most of the nations of the world have become modernistic and God seems way off. We've got all these modern things we look to, all of us. And even in the church of God, For the last five or six years, as most of you know, we've had a watered down, watered down, diluted concept of faith in God. And it's hurt all of us. Let's not kid ourselves. It's hurt all of us. We've got to start to build that faith through our own personal reading of scriptures like this, through a fervent prayer to God, through fasting, through crying out to God to give us that faith. And when we get that faith, we build that faith through the Spirit of God in us and helping us. Then we're going to begin to have miracles. Then we're going to begin to have the signs to back up the work of God perhaps more than we have ever had as the end of this age approaches. Nay, I say definitely more than we have ever had if we do our part. That is God's will, certainly. So I hope that you can all realize that and feel that. We've got to build that faith and yield to God for Him to put that faith in us. But we certainly have our part to do without question. So let's understand that. Uh... Let's go on now. Uh, Jesus here in uh, verse 14. When Jesus had come into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother sick and lying with a fever. And he touched her hand and the fever left her. So another healing. And then he rose and served them. And when evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed. And he cast out the spirits with the word and healed all who were sick. All of them that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. Now, please listen carefully, brethren, because there's been a little play on words here, as some of you know, if you've been reading and listening. Uh, It's been implied that these words in Isaiah were not saying that Christ heals us. It's as though maybe it's just all psychological or it's a spiritual healing. 
But here were sick people who were demon-possessed, and the demons were cast out, and Jesus healed all that were sick. And it just got through describing how he healed the centurion who was sick physically and other people who were sick physically. This was not some psychological thing. And this was not some spiritual healing. These people were deaf. They were crippled. They were blind. They were demon-possessed. And they had all kinds of sicknesses. And Jesus healed these sicknesses, physical sicknesses, not spiritual sicknesses. They were yet unconverted. But he healed these, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. The prophet, the, the, the uh, God, apostle Matthew is inspired by God to interpret Isaiah 53 that way. That is the way. He was inspired to say it. That Jesus took on himself our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Let's turn back to Isaiah at this point. Isaiah chapter 52, something I know you're all familiar with, but let's review it here for a moment. Isaiah 52 and verse uh, for verse 13. We'll begin in verse 13 of Isaiah 52. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Just as many of you, as many were astonished at you, so his visage, that is Christ's face, was marred more than any man. His face was simply like raw hamburger. And as I've described it in previous sermons, a lot of you probably saw the movie uh, Ben-Hur. And you may remember Marsala, you know, the Roman, the, be- the mean guy who was uh, competing against Judah Ben-Hur. And in the chariot race, he was trying to cause Judah Ben-Hur to get knocked down under the chariots and get killed. And instead, it turned around the other way. And he was knocked down and dragged around the arena. And it showed later he had the just sort of a torn up body and face he had. But not as bad as probably Jesus looked. Jesus was torn and beaten with whips and marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. And so he suffered in our stead. Verse or chapter 53, Who has believed our report? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He'll grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. Christ came up in a very weak age, a sinful age, a dry ground. He has no form nor comeliness. Jesus was not the tall, handsome, you know, blonde or red-headed Jew. He looked like all the other Jews. If he'd been different, why, Judas wouldn't have had to come up to kiss him to say, which, you know, show which one he was. He blended right in with all the others. He has no form nor comeliness, and when we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Verse 4. Isaiah 53 now, verse 4. Surely he has borne our griefs and printed right here. I'd have to show you later, but some of you have it printed. Not by me, but by the translators is the word sicknesses in place of griefs. You see, literally it says, the Hebrew is literally sicknesses. He has borne our sicknesses and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. That is, the Jewish people of the time said, well, he deserves it and so on. They thought God was allowing this to punish him. But the psalmist here, or the writer of Isaiah, says, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our sins, not his own. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. By his stripes. The terrible suffering he went through and that scourging under the Romans just before he died. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Is there a duality here? Of course there is. I'm not saying there's not a spiritual duality. And part of this also refers to our our spiritual forgiveness. And God is talking about it. Because it is absolutely true, brethren. And Mr. Armstrong taught as well. He may not have stressed it a lot. But I've certainly heard him teach. And I've taught it for years. That there is a definite duality between the spiritual forgiveness of sin and the physical healing. Certainly they are, and some of these are talking partly about one and partly about the other. But the specific statement, by His stripes we are healed, is talking about physical healing. And then he goes on back more to the aspect that it could apply to the spiritual healing. Now let's turn to the New Testament, brethren. Let's turn to the New Testament, where this is referred to as well, back in 1 Peter 2. 1 Peter Chapter 2, and beginning in verse 21. 
For to this you were called, Peter writes, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. He set us an example of suffering. And certainly he set us an example overall. We've said that, and that's true, and other scriptures show that, that the main thrust is that he suffered for us. Who committed no sin, nor was guile found in his mouth. He set an example in that too. He did not sin. He did not break God's law. Who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. Who himself, Jesus Christ, bore our sins in his own body to the tree. See, he was crucified on a stake, on a tree. Our our spiritual sins, that we, having died to sins through Jesus Christ, might live to righteousness. But then he throws in this other statement, and it is a different statement. He wants to cover the other aspect of Jesus' suffering. By whose stripes you were healed. Isaiah said, are healed. Peter translates it, were healed. Because by that time, the sacrifice had already been made, you see. By whose stripes you were healed. And so he quotes this, and this is the very passage that is also saying in Matthew 8, 17. And Matthew directly says it refers to physical healing. That Jesus was healing these people of physical diseases to fulfill Isaiah, and Jesus quoted Isaiah. All right? Let's be sure we don't let confu- get confused about that. Don't let any of these misguided people confuse you about that from whatever source. That's an important thing. Now, let's go on to Matthew 9. Let's go back again to the book of Matthew, and this time we'll turn uh, to uh, chapter 9. And a very important aspect of, of this uh, subject here, which I've already referred to. Uh, so he got into a boat at this point, Jesus Christ, Matthew 9 and verse 1, and came to his own city. And behold, they brought to him a paralytic, a paralyzed man, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, yes, we have to have faith, normally speaking. I know that Jesus healed some people who apparently didn't have faith, but most of them he did talk about their faith. And most of the time through the Bible, God shows that once you know God, you know, once you know about God and you're being called by Him, you're expected to act on your faith. Now, sometimes Christ healed people, and at the beginning, Peter may have as well, to kind of show them where God was working. But once they know where God is working, they're expected to have faith and trust in that God. And so this man had faith, and he said to him, Son, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven you. You see, healing and the forgiveness of sin are very closely related. And they fit together in the gospel. And at once some of the scribes said, This man blasphemes. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier, to say, Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, Arise and walk? See, one is part of the other, quite often. And you trust in God, and God can do either one. And healing is a type of the forgiveness of sins, to show that God has that power. But that you may know, that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, and Christ does have that power, then he said to the paralytic, Arise, take up your bed and go to your house. And he arose and departed, and when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God who had given such power to men. And Christ was a man, and some people say, Well, he's the only man who ever had that kind of power to heal like that. And of course, that's not true at all. I think all of you know that, but we'll be reviewing that a little bit as we go along. That's not true at all. Let's go ahead to Matthew 10 now, and we'll begin to see that. In one of the recent uh, booklets that has come out, they try to give the impression that Christ was showing that He was the Son of God by healing, and in recent sermons about uh, how Christ was 100% God and 100% man, which is kind of silly, you know, you can't be 100% both at all, and they try to give that impression. Why, the thought is that Christ did all these miracles because He was the Son of God and no one could do anything like that, healing the sick and raising the dead and casting out demons and walking on water and so forth. And the fellow who gave that sermon used to be one of my students, but I didn't teach him that. (laughs) And uh, I, uh, anyway, I didn't teach him that. He forgets all the other scriptures, as you know, about how Elijah walked across the Jordan, you know, and then when Elijah was taken up in the chariot... Why, Elisha got the cloak of Elijah, and then he walked back forth to the Jordans and threw his cloak out, you know, the, the, the mantle of Elijah, and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And once again, the waters pottered hither and thither, as it says in the King James, and so on. Many servants of God have done things like that back in the Old Testament as well as the New. 
So we don't want to get our mind, allow our mind to get screwed up. Prove all things, brethren. And if I'm wrong on something in this church or this work, you have every right to come to me. Or if you can't get to me, why well, go to Mr. Davis or go to Mr. Joseph or go to my wife so she can tell me. And uh, let us know about it. We want to change it. We want to grow. We're to live by every word of God. I hope we can always say, as Mr. Armstrong used to say, Brethren, blow the dust off your Bible. You know, prove these things in your Bible. And I hope we can begin to do that on these radio broadcasts. I'd better remember to do that when we start on the radio and try to imitate that in a right way because that's what ought to be done. It's not what we say. It's what God says that counts. Anyway, in Matthew 10, beginning in verse 1, when Jesus had called His twelve disciples to Him... And remember, brethren, they were still carnal. They didn't have God's Spirit yet. Peter later denied Christ three times and cursed and swore and said, I don't know the man. And then when the cock crowed, remember, he went out and wept bitterly. He was all frustrated. Jesus tried to get him to stay up and pray, and he didn't do that. And he was all, and he chopped, tried to chop the guy's uh, ear off, remember. And Jesus put it back on and said, They that take the sword shall perish with the sword. He warned Peter about that. Peter didn't pray. And then he did get mad and chopped the soldier's ear off. And then he denied Christ three times. He wasn't converted yet himself. Most of the, all these disciples, of course, were not converted at this time. But Jesus sent them out and gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Didn't make any difference what kind it was. God is not impressed by some scientific name the doctors come up with. Or if all the doctors in the world say AIDS is incurable, God just smiles, you know, bang, He can cure it in a second, whatever it is. Other diseases yet to come. That makes no difference to God. And as we get more incurable diseases going around, and some of us may get them, we hope we won't, but we know several people in the church have had AIDS through uh, blood transfusions and other things like that. We hope none of us get them through drug usage or, of course, illicit sex. But we don't know how, how these things are going to be spread and other similar kind of diseases. We're going to have to rely on God. We can't rely on anything else when those things come along. Verse 5. These twelve Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles or Samaritans. Go to the lost sheep of Israel. And verse 7 is the key verse. Notice what these men were to do. Three things. Number one, as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Of course, it's called in Mark, Luke, and John, the kingdom of God. All right, they were to do, first of all, this was the work of the gospel. This is the work of the church, the work of the ministry. What is it? Number one, preach the gospel of the kingdom of God. Two, heal the sick, verse 8. Cleanse the lepers, raise the dead. Now, we're not going to have many dead people raised because Peter only raised one and Paul only raised one in their whole ministry. And uh, I'm not an apostle, so I may not raise anybody nor any the rest of us. But and Mr. Armstrong never did. But there could be a dead person raised before the end. We want to know that and have faith that if that's God's will. But I'm going to lip, lump all these kind of together as various forms of healing, you know. Uh, cleansing the lepers is just a different healing. And raising the dead is restoring back to physical life. Thirdly, cast out demons. Because most of the time it doesn't say raise the dead. It just says heal the sick, you see. So those three things... Preach the gospel, number one. Heal the sick, number two. Number three, cast out demons. Those are the three things that are mentioned several times in Christ's ministry. And also, as you get into the book of Acts, you'll see that also, that the true servants of God did that. Those who were really faithful. That's what they did do. And that's what we should be doing as we get closer to God. But again, you might say, well, uh, you, I want you to go do that now, uh, Mr. Meredith. Well, that's fine. But I'd better have all of you praying and fasting. We'd all better build the faith. And we can have Mr. Joseph go do that now if he's ready. And uh, we may have some more of you later ordained as elders. And then the minute you get your bottle of oil and say, Now now you can quit talking, fellow. Now you can quit doing. Oh, oh, or start doing, I should say. And it's a little harder once you have your own bottle of oil. Well, Mr. Simpkins is there. He's been a minister for many years. He knows that too, Mr. Frank Simpkins. And uh, you've got to have faith. And you've got to do it also, brethren, which I'll cover in a later sermon, in an atmosphere of faith. When Jesus went back home to Nazareth, it says, as you know, He could there do no mighty work. Why? It says because of their unbelief. Not His unbelief, their unbelief. There was an atmosphere of disbelief. There was not an atmosphere of faith. And so we've got to build that atmosphere of faith. But here are the three things they were to do. All right? And some will say this and have said, well, that was just for Christ and the original twelve apostles. Blah, blah, blah. 
Oh, is that so? No, that's not so. These gifts were not just for Christ and the original twelve apostles. To prove that, let's go now, uh, brethren, over to Luke. Luke chapter 10. First we came to uh, uh, Matthew 10, and then the parallel is in Luke 10. Easy to remember. Matthew 10 and Luke 10. And in Luke chapter 10, uh, we find the same thing, in a sense, except it involves more people. Luke 10, verse 1. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also. Oh, 70 others. Others beside the 12 apostles. Now all of a sudden, the men involved here. And he sent them out two and two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. And then you find uh, what they were to do. Uh, he said in verse uh, uh, 8, Whatever city you enter, and they receive you, eat such things as are set before you. Verse 9, And heal the sick. All right, they were to heal the sick who are there, and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near you. You see, the kingdom of God was there in the person of these apostles in that sense, and these servants. They weren't apostles. They were 70 others also, like Mr. Armstrong used to send out young men on these baptizing tours. So in their person, the kingdom of God was represented by these representatives. So you have the kingdom of God being preached. You have the healing. Nothing about demons. No, there is. Notice verse 17 a little bit later. Then the 70 return, verse 17 describes, with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. So all three are mentioned, again, for the 70 others. Number one, preach the gospel. Number two, heal the sick. Number three, cast out demons. That is part of the work of the church of God. That's what Jesus did. That's what the apostles did. That's what the other 70 did. And we want to tie in healing, you see, with the preaching of the gospel and realize it ought to be a normal part of the work. That doesn't mean everybody will be healed and everybody will be healed instantaneously. It depends on their faith. And certainly as God caused Christ to begin to raise up the church, He performed greater miracles through Him as a whole because He was the Son of God. And then when Peter first started to preach, or remember in Acts chapter 5, even Peter's shadow passing over people healed them. Later on, you find, though, that other people were not healed quite as much because as they got bigger, they didn't need those dramatic things to show them where God was working. And perhaps, just like in our case, maybe the faith, once Jesus was dead, you know, maybe the faith began to fade a little bit, a little bit, every few years, a little bit less faith, a little bit less reliance on God. And certainly that can occur, and we've got to be aware of that and try to be sure we build faith as we draw toward Christ's return again rather than get away from faith. All right, now let's go to Acts chapter 6. Let's go now, brethren, to Acts chapter 6 and notice an example here uh, in Acts chapter 6 where they were ordaining these deacons, as you know, to serve and wait on tables of the widows. And they decided to appoint seven men, it says in verse 3, of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. The business was waiting on tables of these widows. And so they chose, verse 5, Stephen. See, they didn't have voting. They chose, they appointed Stephen, a man full of faith, and the Holy Spirit, and Philip as well. And then it named some of the others. But Stephen and Philip were mentioned first. As you'll see, they were the most zealous ones whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. And the word of God spread, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly. They already had a few thousand, and now they began to get tens of thousands of brethren. In Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Now, verse 8, notice. And Stephen, here's a man ordained the last time we hear about him, apparently a few days or a few weeks earlier. What was he ordained to? Everything indicates he was ordained as a deacon. Doesn't say anything about evangelists, that they were appointing them just to wait on tables, and the indication from everything is that these men were ordained to be deacons. They were ordained deacons, and the next thing we find here, Stephen, full of faith and power did great wonders and signs among the people. Oh, here's someone beside the twelve. Here's someone beside the other seventy also. Stephen was doing it. And undoubtedly he performed healings because wherever you find these miracles done, healing was the main one of the miracles they always did do. And I know of no exception to that. Then you go over to chapter 8. So here's Deacon Stephen, let's say, performing these miracles. And then over in chapter 8 of Acts, turn to chapter 8 and beginning in verse 5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria. Here's this other man ordained a deacon, but now functioning as an evangelist, certainly. So maybe he was an evangelist by now, but he certainly wasn't an apostle, or it would have been mentioned. 
and he preached Christ to them. And multitude, with one accord, he did the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles that he did. What kind of miracles? Verse 7. For unclean spirits, demons, crying with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed and many who were paralyzed, and the lame were healed. So people were healed by Stephen and by Philip. Other men, deacons, maybe began acting as evangelists. So we have their names in here also. So that's very important to understand. All right? I want now to kind of call attention to uh, a little bit here, some of this. Well, I'll go ahead to one or two other scriptures before I get to adding up the numbers, just so you kind of get the impact of this. Let's go to Acts 14 now. Acts chapter 14 at this point. And here we find, uh, beginning in verse 1, the story of Paul and Barnabas after they had been, of course, ordained as apostles through the Holy Spirit, direct, through the Holy Spirit's direction. Now, it, it, came, or it happened in Iconium that they, that is Paul and Barnabas, went together into the synagogue of the Jews and so spoke that a great multitude, you see, great numbers, both of the Jews and of the Greeks believed. And, but the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brethren. Therefore, they stayed, a long, they stayed there a long time, speaking boldly in the Lord, who was bearing witness. Notice this. Christ was bearing witness to the word of His grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. Their hands. See, Paul and Barnabas. So here's two more men to add to the list. Paul and Barnabas. Not just Paul, Paul and Barnabas. But the multitude of the city, verse 4, was divided, part sided with the Jews and part with the apostles. Plural. So Paul and Barnabas were both apostles because it mentions apostles in the plural. And then in verse 8, In Lystra, a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting, a cripple from his mother's womb who had never walked. And this man heard Paul speaking. And Paul, observing him intently, seeing that he had the faith to be healed, since the nodding and the something just coming back from this man, he knew that man was on fire for God. He had faith. And he said with a loud voice, Stand up straight on your feet, he said to this crippled man. And he leaped and walked and was healed right then by Paul. And so Paul and Barnabas were performing this kind of miracles. And they were used of God in that way long after the death of Jesus Christ. And throughout the book of Acts, as you know, you find this kind of thing going on. Healing, brethren, was always the major miracle that Jesus performed. Healing was the major single miracle that the apostles performed. Healing, brethren, was not just any answer to any prayer. I think if you've read the booklet on that, you realize that's what they're saying. Healing is just like an answer. You ask for a better job and you get a better job and healing is just like that. No, it's not. It's similar in the sense that God can hear any prayer, but healing is a direct type of the forgiveness of sin and Jesus Christ was beaten and lashed with whips to bring that about in a very special way. And we need to realize healing is the special miracle that God performed again and again and again. It's not just any miracle. It ties in directly with Christ's beating. It ties in directly with the sacrifice. It ties in directly with the Passover. And as we approach the Passover, we'll have another sermon on that. I will not try to cover that aspect today unless you want me to preach till midnight like the Apostle Paul did. <laughs> okay. But notice this. Let's get to the numbers game now, as we call it. But I thought this was funny. I never thought of that until this until a year or two ago. But notice, we have the original 17 apostles. That is, we have Paul, I mean, excuse me, we have the 12 apostles, and then remember, Judas betrayed Christ and was replaced by Matthias. And I'm sure Matthias did the same thing if he was replacing Judas Iscariot. That's 13. Then we have James and Jude, the Lord's brother, you see, Lord's brothers, no doubt were apostles, everything indicates that, and they wrote the books bearing their name, the book of James and the book of Jude. That's 15. Then we have Paul and Barnabas, right? That's 17. Okay, you've got the original, uh, let's say first of all, you've got the 70 others, all right, that's 70 who went out performing healings. Then you've got the 17 apostles, 70 and 17 is uh, 87, and then you've got Philip and Stephen, so you get up to 89. Now some of you may come up, 89 is not a good number, it can come on some of the better number, but anyway, I've added up 89. And certainly when you add up the men of God in the Old Testament, you could come up with a lot more. But just in the New Testament, you find directly mentioned, probably a lot of others did them, of course, but you find directly mentioned 
89 different individuals who performed these miracles. And if you had Timothy, who was faithful, Titus, Philemon, Epaphroditus, you know all the others who may have been faithful to Paul, probably you get up toward 100 men that were performing miracles. And so it wasn't just healings and miracles performed by Jesus Christ alone. Oh yes, they were all performed by Jesus Christ, but they were performed by Christ through His servants. We don't do them. Christ does that in and through us. And that's to His honor and His glory. But He did not just do them of and by Himself and in His own physical body. So let's understand that. Eighty-nine different men are indicated as having performed miracles and healings. The miracles were not restricted to Jesus in the original twelve. So let's understand. These signs were an integral part of preaching the gospel, as I've explained, brethren. And as the global church of God goes out and grows, and as we do the work, I hope all of you will get behind us and pray and fast and beseech God to grant us the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of healing. Plural. The gifts. Plural is mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12. The gifts of healing. Some can just be healed by the anointed cloth or by the prayer of the elder, but then there's also the gift of just commanding it to be done. And perhaps different aspects of healing in that way are implied when it says gifts of healing. And if we pray for those gifts, I'm sure they will be given. Uh, We need to seek these gifts. God tells you to seek Him with all your heart. If we don't seek them, we're not going to have them. But we may not have them instantly in a faithless age. We've got to learn to walk with God and get close to God, and then we'll begin to have more of these gifts in doing the work. But also, brethren, we do need balance. And I mentioned that before. And I want us to get our balance on that approach. If I'm wrong, I pray God will show me that I am following. And I want you to know that I'm following Mr. Armstrong on this and what not only he said in the early booklet or in his earliest sermons, but what he later came to understand and what he did do in his own life. Again, I say, and a lot of you know, that beside his son Ted and Herman Hay and Raymond McNair, those three other men, I spent as much time with him and was as close to him as any other living human being. And I mean that, uh, or that's in the church. Beside his, his, well, he only has one daughter still alive. Dor- uh, Beverly died and Dorothy's still alive. But at any rate, uh, they didn't spend very much time with their father at all for the last 40 years. I know that because he was so busy in the work. We saw him far, far more than they did. And they, they, they realized that. What was the number one subject we discussed every single year, every single January in the two-week ministerial conference? I shouldn't say number one, but it was one of the two major ones. Every single year we discussed healing and where to draw the line. Every single year until we finally settled it somewhat. It wasn't perfectly settled, but in 1974, uh, the situation on divorce and remarriage, we used to discuss divorce and remarriage. Those two things every year. And I've been with Mr. Armstrong in between when the others weren't here trying to discuss where to draw the line. And this person, that person. Personally, when they'd call. And as the superintendent of ministers, I'd have to bring these cases. Well, this, this minister says his, his uh, person back here has this disease and wants to know what to do. And I'd have to be the one to go to Mr. Armstrong about it. I know what he said. I know what he taught. And I know what he didn't know. Because God has not revealed everything to us. And he was trying to do the best he could with what he had to do with. And not just to guess. And not to get all unbalanced. And perhaps get in a big federal lawsuit and get the whole work of God closed down. Which he didn't want to do either. Let's turn to Second Chronicles 16. Here is a statement, and I'm not going to read all the statements like this. This is just an example of others that you might know about that we have misused in the past. And I say misused, not totally, but partially misused. And not willingly, it was just something I think that sneaked up on us. But notice Second Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 12. Second Chronicles 16. beginning in verse 12, talking about King Asa. And in the 39th year of his reign, Asa, who as you know was king of Judah, became diseased in his feet, and his malady was very severe. Yet in his disease he did not seek the eternal, but the physicians. So Asa rested with his fathers. He died in the 41st year of his reign. In other words, God didn't heal him. Now, we've used that cell. Well, Asa went to the doctor and God zapped him and boy, he killed right then. Well, that's reading something into the Bible that the Bible does not say. Now, first of all, the physicians back there may well have been priests of Baal-zebub. We don't know that. They were all around and some, some uh, you know, men that were physicians were probably connected with pagan religions in the first place and maybe shouldn't have been gone to at all. 
I know that some people try to extrapolate and say, well, all doctors are pagans and they're all uh, priests of Baal. But that is not true. That is not true at all. Many very, very sincere men and young men that I've known, and my first cousin, for instance, I'm not holding up for him. He's carnal and doesn't know God, but sincerely wanted to serve people. And I know him and went in, and he's an orthopedic surgeon. And when people get injured on the ski slopes or get all banged up, well, he helps set their bones and work with their tendons and get them walking again and all that kind of thing and so on. Very sincere men go into medicine to help people and the best they can. They do not find to fight God. They're not worshiping Baal. They just are trying to do the best they can. So it's not necessary to say that all the physicians today are, are false uh, prophets. They're not or, or going to pagan gods. But the problem that is stated, it says, in his disease he did not seek the eternal. That is the problem. There are times when we should go to doctors. Now you say, when? When should we go to doctors, Mr. Meredith? Well, I'll get to that. But I'll tell you later, we don't always know exactly where to draw the line. And do you want me to draw a line for you? Do you want me to draw a great big book and write a great big book and say, Thou shalt go to a doctor if you have this, but thou shalt not go to a doctor if you have that? Do you really want that? Would that make you happy if we would do that? I think most of you know better than that. We can't draw lines for that on that for one another. And we tried to do that for about 40 years in the ministerial conferences, brethren, under Mr. Armstrong's direction. And we could not do that. We don't know because God hasn't said. So there are things we should do. And certainly if you get injured on the ski slopes or in your auto accident on the freeway here going home, you'd better go to a doctor. I'll tell you that. And get that bone set or whatever it is they need to do. That is the right thing to do. You say, well, maybe the doctor will give me some drugs. Well, maybe he will. But, you know, you're getting all kinds of poisons in the air you breathe. You want to escape that? Better get out of here then. You're getting poisons in the food you eat. You better get clear out of the earth. You're getting poisons in the fish you eat because the poisons are on. You're going to get poison from a lot of different sources, and you can't escape all that. So try not to kid yourself about it. Maybe the doctors will give you some drugs that they shouldn't give more than they're necessary to do the job, but they're going to try to do the best they can in most cases. So get a first-class doctor to do a first-class job Try to get quality within your means. Pray to God to guide it the right way. And then get your bones set or your cut healed up or whatever. And then ask God in faith to do what the doctors can't do and cause it to heal properly, which it might not do without His intervention. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. And you'd better do it. And uh, certainly what Mr. Armstrong did always do and did always teach. So anyway... The problem is Asa did not seek God. You need some of these other examples in the Old Testament the same way. Now you come to the New Testament, and let's turn in the New Testament to Luke chapter 8. Let's go to Luke chapter 8 now. And here's another example I think that we need to understand in a more positive way, but we haven't emphasized it perhaps the way we should have done. At Luke 8 and verse 43, here's Jesus beginning walking and around and blessing and healing people. Now a woman, verse 43, having a flow of blood for 12 years, who had spent all her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed by any, came from behind and touched the border of his garment, and her blood stopped, and she was trembling, and came and told, in verse 47, how she was healed immediately. And what did Jesus say? You rotten sinner, you went to the doctors. You went to the doctors. No, he didn't say anything about that. She had not known, maybe, that she could have come to God. In fact, there wasn't any great prophet around before Christ to heal her anyway. But he doesn't say anything. He just said, Daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. So the emphasis is not upon your being a sinner if you go to doctors. Certainly, if you go to doctors continuously and you're always looking to medicine and looking to drug that do, drugs that interfere with the normal workings of the body, that is wrong. And I think a lot of us know that. But you have to draw the line and decide where that is. And I can't do that for you. I can give you general advice, but I can't do that for you. And I hope that none of the ministers in this church do try to do that because that gets into the realm of practicing medicine. And we can be put in prison for practicing medicine. And we shouldn't do that. Not that we think it's practicing medicine, but you know how the lawyers interpret it today. And the judges, they have the American Medical Association on their, on their neck about it. Now, uh, back in... Uh, uh, Matthew 9 is another such example. Let's turn back to Matthew 9 again, and we'll cover something now that we did not cover before. Matthew chapter 9, and beginning in verse 11 this time. And when the Pharisees saw it, that is, he was there with these tax collectors in this uh, Pharisee's home, 
they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician. This is Matthew 9, verse 12. Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. The direct implication from Jesus of Nazareth is that those who are sick have need of a physician. Now, he didn't say what the physician is supposed to do or not supposed to do. I wish he had. Honestly, it would make it a lot of simpler, wouldn't it? If he said, now here's where you draw the line. You can have repair surgery, but no other surgery. And you're not to take any drug to try to cure a disease, but if you have a headache and your head's about to come off, well, you know the aspirin's not going to kill the, 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 heal, heal the disease, but you can take that to relieve the pain. But don't try to heal the real source caused by drugs, but you can have, a, you can have an aspirin. Now, I'll give you that little benefit once in a while. You can zap yourself with an aspirin. Or he told us a bunch of other things. But, of course, they didn't have all these drugs back there. And Jesus didn't tell us all those details. He lets us learn that and figure that out. But the implication is there are things that men can do and probably should do. And I mean that. Mr. Armstrong said that over and over. And I know some people among us tend to worship Mr. Armstrong. And they think Mr. Armstrong set great standards and kept those exactly. And you can't ever change that. And I love him and I honor him. And I say again in public... No man that I know of has ever done more in the work of God since the original apostles and Herbert W. Armstrong. And he was a man of God. And he was like a second father to me. And I really mean it. And I do love him. And I honor him. But he was not God. And he made his mistakes. But also, he did not try to get picky about these little points. And he did not try to force people into a certain mold on something that God does not give us instruction about. If God leaves it for us to decide, we'd better let it be decided by each individual and not try to write out a great big book of rules and of do's and don'ts about it. Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, those who are sick apparently do at times. But go and learn what this means, Jesus said, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Now, why did he say that right after the other? Well, you might think about that. There are times that maybe we go beyond and maybe a little bit more to doctors than we should. Is God going to zap us and send us into the lake of fire? Of course not. He knows it's not completely clear in our minds. He knows there are certain things that He wants us to do or we ought to do. And we're sincerely, and if I should say, we're sincerely trying to draw the line the best we can. God knows that. He's not trying to get us in trouble. He's trying to get us into His kingdom, if I may put it that way. He's a God of mercy. He desires mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And of course that is talking, the big part of this is talking about the aspect of having mercy on these sinners spiritually. But even in this matter of healing, I think there is an application there, a little bit of a dual application in that situation. All right, we do need to get our balance on the subject of healing. And I hope and pray that all of us can get that. When Mr. Armstrong was with Dick Armstrong up in... uh, Santa Maria at the hospital after Dick had been crushed, just virtually crushed by this car, uh, they gave him, they gave Dick virtually everything. And Mr. Armstrong was not turning away from God. He just knew that Dick had injuries all the way through his body and bones were crushed and this had to be moved. And he said, I can't tell. And I've heard him tell tell it later. I can't get in there and tell the doctors which drug to do and which not to do. I just had to trust God to guide it. And that's what he did do. And I'm not, I could tell, talk to you more about that. I don't want to dwell on that in public, but I know because I heard Mr. Armstrong to discuss it. And I heard Norman Smith discuss it. He was right there in person with it and saw it, saw it happen there. A, a lot of it. And Dr. Merrill, who was there, the advisory doctor, our church doctor, the name was not Merritt, but Merrill. And he was there, Ralph E. Merrill, who was the college physician at that time. Uh, when I had my eye injury why, uh, from handball right in the eye, Mr. Armstrong told me three times to go get repair surgery to this detached retina. And I did. And I'm not sorry I did that. It wasn't a, a sickness. It was just that the retina had smashed. It was slipping away and like a complete blinding, just black curtain moving across the eye. I was anointed, of course. But God did not heal it. And the doctors had to somehow get in and push it back. And then with a the probe, they call it, kind of like a, a fancy welding job, they catch the, this little membrane and weld it. They sort of burn it to the edge of the eye and it holds then. It's still holding. I had that operation in March of 1970. So we're coming up on, uh, what would it be, 23 years ago, and I still have both eyes rather than one eye. And uh, people can judge about that, but Mr. Armstrong told me to do that three times. Gerald Waterhouse, as you know, had a rupture 
uh, and he had that repaired uh, by doctors. And many, many, many others, of course, since. Literally, of course, thousands of our brethren have had various things done. I'm not saying they are all, all use the right wisdom. I don't know. I just feel that most of them were sincere. And if they trusted God and if they looked to God too and were trying to do what man should do and then ask God to do what man cannot or should not do, God is not going to condemn them. And if one of you has absolute faith, uh, you should trust God on almost anything. Mr. Burke McNair, as a lot of you know, one of our evangelists and was my brother-in-law for many, many years. He's our minister now in Corpus Christi. He had a terrible situation with appendicitis back in the 1950s. He had three churches. Liberal, Kansas, Friday night. He drove all the way over to Liberal from north of Denver and then back to Pueblo, south of Denver, then up north of Denver to Longmont. 850-mile circuit. 850 miles every Sabbath when you include the Friday afternoon drive over to Liberal. And he was going and going all through the week conducting Bible studies and building the church area in this mountain area. And I guess he had a lot of problems. He was just worn down. And he got a terrible situation with appendicitis. He got anointed by a local elder or cloth from Pasadena. I don't know what, but when Liz was about to die, and Billy Sue called up crying, and Mr. Armstrong got word around to several of us evangelists, and we all began to pray and fast. And right then, finally, God healed Burke McNair of, of appendicitis. And he didn't have any operation or anything done. God healed him. And I've heard of many others who were healed by it. But I also know that some parents who may be newer in the church, maybe they don't have quite the faith that Mr. McNair did, and I don't look down on them because I don't know what I would do in every case, and you don't know what you would do in every case until you're writhing in pain. You don't know that, brethren, so don't think you do. But their boy, maybe their little six-year-old boy or ten-year-old boy, is about to die of appendicitis, and they decide to let the doctor cut it out. Now, the thing for all of us in the church to do is say, well, ha, ha, boy, you're a sinner, aren't you? You went to the doctor. No, that is not for us to do. That is not our job to judge those people. That's up to them to make the decision. They're scared to death. They don't have this total faith. And no one does have the faith of Jesus Christ completely. And so each one of us needs to decide ourselves where to draw the line. And I hope we can really understand that. So, first of all, we need to try hard to stay well. And as time goes on, I've told you, brethren, we're going to try to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God and the true name of Jesus Christ. And the true name of Jesus Christ involves the whole way of life that we used to teach involving, you know, the laws of health and things along that line and the statutes of God and things along that line and so on. We need to teach that way of life very much. And most of you have read the booklet that I wrote on the seven laws of radiant health. And we should try to obey those laws and not get sick in the first place. And then if we get an injury, a traumatic injury, our bone is broken or our rib cage is crushed, of course we've got to go to a doctor. There's no example of God resetting the whole thing. I suppose He could. If you know you have perfect faith and you sit there, and I'm not condemning you, but you'd better not condemn me because I'm going to the doctor <laughs> until God shows me otherwise if I get crushed by something. So you better decide how much faith you have and be sure. In a general sickness like pneumonia, or some other kind of sickness, cancer. Each one of you has to study about the foods that you ought to be eating and natural remedies and the drugs involved and doing some other kind of treatment and the side effects, and all drugs do have side effects, and then you make your decision where to draw the line. And don't expect the church to make it for you, and don't judge your neighbor if they make a decision different from what you would make because it's not your kid that has appendicitis, it's their kid. You see what I mean? So let's not judge each other. Learn to believe, though, that God can and will heal. And if we build this atmosphere of faith, then we'll have more appendix healed. We'll have more cancer healed. We'll have more heart disease healed. You see what I mean? That will come naturally. But in the meantime, we don't judge each other. You can't legislate your faith into someone else's head. And you may not even know how much faith you have anyway because your faith may not be tested in the same way right at that time. As I say, you're not the one writhing in pain right then. They are, or their child is. But as we learn to grow in faith, we'll have more healings, no question about it. So don't try to draw draw the line for one another. In James 5, in James chapter 5, brethren, uh, and uh, let's begin, and this is a very basic scripture we're all familiar with, but let's begin in verse 13. James 5 and verse 13, James writes, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is any among you sick? 
So here's the command of God. This is a command, instruction in the Bible. Is any sick, let him call for the elders of the church. This is not a crushed rib cage. This is not a broken bone. This is a moving sickness, a terrible cold, diphtheria, uh, you know, uh, pneumonia, whatever, a sickness. Call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And all our elders do carry little bottles of oil, and I've got mine here, and if any of you need to be anointed any time, I'm carrying it nearly all the time with me. Oil is a symbol of God's Spirit, and we'll bring more about that. But all of you have been in the church for a while, so I don't think I need to go into that. So anointing him with oil in the name of Christ, acting for Jesus Christ. And the prayer of faith will save the sick. That's God's promise. It will save the sick. And the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed sins, he will be forgiven. And then it goes on and says, Confess your trespasses one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Now this is dual too. I can agree that this may involve spiritual healing. But in context, I think it's talking more about physical healing. You're to con- Confess your weaknesses, confess your sins, confess the fact, well, I've eaten too much ice cream or I had too much this or lost too much sleep and I have this sickness and ask for mercy from God and ask your brethren to pray with you about it that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Much. Great power in the prayer of a righteous man. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Brethren, if anyone... Well, that's enough of that. Uh, That goes to another subject now. So Elijah literally shut up the heavens with his prayer. Let's go now back to the Gospel of Mark one more time. Turn with me, if you would, back to the Gospel of Mark. And let's turn to chapter 16. Mark 16, verse 14. Afterward, near the end of Jesus' life, after His resurrection, I should say, He appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table, and He rebuked their unbelief. See, even after Jesus' resurrection, they still didn't believe the way we should. they should. How much more us? We're weak. We need more faith. Again, I ask you, brethren, please pray together, all of us. Say, Father in heaven, give us in the global church. And all of you, brethren, hearing this on tape out there, please pray this that God will give us more of an atmosphere of faith in this church to empower the work of God to be done. He rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen Him after He had risen. And He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes we've got to have faith and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. Notice now. Notice verse 17. Very important. And remember, brethren, some of the modern versions do not have these verses in, but the vast majority of the Greek texts do have them in, and the Textus Receptus, the basic text that the Greek Orthodox Church preserved, does have these verses in, and they do belong in the Bible. These signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. Yes, we should have that power and pray for that power. They will speak with new tongues. God may give us yet the gift of speaking foreign languages supernaturally if we pray about it and develop a greater atmosphere of faith. They will take up serpents and if they drink any deadly thing, like Paul accidentally handled that serpent that time, or not to try to do it, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. These signs shall follow them that believe. This is the work of the great God. We've got to pray for these and get close to God. We intend to have these. And I know God will give us these as we walk with Him. So then after the Lord had spoken to them, He was received up into heaven, sat down at the right hand of God, and they went out and preached everywhere. This is the work of God. They went out everywhere. The Lord, that is the risen Jesus Christ of Nazareth, sitting at the right hand of God, working with them and confirming the Word with the accompanying signs. Or as King James has it, with signs following. (laughs) And that is what He did. He confirmed the word with signs following. And brethren, we will have those signs as we walk with God. It's part of the work of God. And let's take it that way, be thankful for it, believe in God, but be balanced in the way we do it and know that we are occasionally needed to do our part. We do occasionally need to do our part, but God can go above and beyond our part again and again. He has, He can, and He will. 
So let's build an atmosphere of faith into this church and into our lives. And we're going to see the preaching of the gospel backed up by a great deal more power. And we can be thankful for that because we know that it will happen as we do our part.